Hello, and thanks for joining Your Body Advocate podcast. Today, we have a really interesting interview with Annalie Sullivan. She is an ICU nurse that is going to talk to us about the process of dying and how we can look at it differently. It's a fascinating interview. Please enjoy. Let's take a deep breath to relax. Ready? You're listening to Your Body Advocate, telling your body's side of the story. The podcast dedicated to supporting and improving your body-mind connection so you can live a pain-free, passion-filled life, dissolving one body tension at a time. Discover the healing properties of your own body language, and together, let's explore ways to support and improve essential self-talk. Now, here's your host, Master of Encouragement and Body-Mind Life Coach, Ruth Cummings. Okay, so today I have the pleasure of sitting with and interviewing for our podcast pleasure today, my friend, Annalie Sullivan, who is a death coach. Yeah. Tell me, what is a death coach? A death coach is a fun name to excite people, but it's also somebody, myself, who gets to help people walk through the process of dying, whether it is the person who is actually experiencing death or it's their family, friends, loved ones who are experiencing the death of someone else in their life. That is amazing. I think that so many people need that and we don't even know it. Yes, definitely. So I'm also a nurse in the ICU as well as a hospice volunteer and I work with families all the time who are completely blindsided by death. Even if they knew it was coming, they are missing the experience with it. They're missing like a work ethic, you know, in the like 16 and 1800s, they actually used to put out like manuals on the ethics of how to die. And so they had like values on how we should actually conduct ourselves during this process. But I think our culture today is largely missing this. So often somebody's diagnosed and they don't have a roadmap for processing the diagnosis or the wife of the husband who suddenly died doesn't have a roadmap for what to do next. And a A big part of our society, I think, really is kind of about ignoring death. We're about living our best lives, but we don't connect that to the final process of our life and living our best deaths. And like, what does that even mean? It can sound a little controversial. So yeah, I do think a large part of my job as an ICU nurse is helping people accept death and and kind of show up for it. And so that now is something I've taken on as a bigger project as a death coach. Wow, that's amazing! Really, Thank you. this is I'm I'm so excited to be able to share this with so many people who need you. So I want to go back to something you said. Okay. The ethics of dying. Then it was that there was a book. So yeah, there pamphlet, used to like, be. Talk about that. I wish I I, had no I don't idea have the that existed. I have the notes. I'm writing a book about death and dying and I have the notes on this so I'll have to come back to you with the more details but they used to publish little pamphlets like in Victorian age think of this and it's kind of like the art of dying and it's really just you were just diagnosed with tuberculosis we know you're going to die how should you talk how should you interact with others what should your priorities be right now and that's a conversation completely absent in today's culture and society (laughs) Well, right. I mean, there's so much to do. Yes. And but not just about finances, not just about the doctors. Yeah. But so, what do you see that people miss? What are what are we not getting at the end? I think one of the largest problems that I see, whether it's the person dying or the person experiencing someone else's death, is the focus. And this is natural. This makes sense. You're scared, right? And what happens when we're scared? Our cortisol shuts off our frontal lobe. We resort to our amygdala. Like we resort to the part of our brain that is individualized and introspective and we become very selfish. And that's a survival mechanism. It makes you focus on you, but it, in focusing on you, you're cut off from your relationships. You're cut off from your meaning, your values. Oftentimes, if you think about the values that guide your life, they're outward directed, right? Like. I, I mean, especially if, if we think of religion, 
they're the ones who usually give people the most like values to direct their life. But oftentimes it's how we conduct ourselves so that we treat other people well. And that is often where we find the most meaning in our lives is in community with one another. Our relationships are some of the most important part. But when we're stressed, when we're afraid, we think of ourselves And we stop acting in a way that is cohesive with our values, cohesive with our relationships, and we have a lot of regrets. And I, I've lost track of the question, honestly. Sorry. (laughs) Yeah, I was just thinking about that. (laughs) What was the question? Like, what do you see that? Mm -hmm. um, Like, we've talked a little bit already about, you know, to leave a legacy. To help oh, people yes. leave a legacy. So w- what, I, what I'm what i curious about my own family mm-hmm. and my own experiences of people dying in mm-hmm. my life and my family is, um, you know, is every, is, is every conversation that they want to have, mm-hmm. has that been had? Right. Okay. That takes me to t- the back to the last question as well. I think I was mentioning relationships. Relationships and things are two of the biggest stressors when people are dying. What do they do with all of the things they've accumulated and which relationships do they focus on and how? And so obviously we don't need things when we're dying, but things are very meaningful to us. They are attached to our identities and who we are and how we relate to others. And a huge part of the process of dying is deciding who to give what. And part of that is like, this means a lot to me. I want, I want to know that I'm remembered. I want to know that this person wakes up and sees this painting or this thing that I gave them and then they think of me. And so some of that is things, but also that boils back down to the relationships and it boils down to who's, who are the relationships that you either need to express love to, you need to express forgiveness, you need to express pride, you need to express apologies. Like all of these things are really what lead to a fulfilled death or one where you're still very scared and you're depressed. You don't have to be depressed in your last moments of life, even though it is the end. And I think that is something that people aren't fully aware of. So this is so fascinating. And I'm going to change the subject just real quick because... We don't have you for very long today. We're going to do another one, I know. Mm -hmm. But for our audience today, if there, if someone out there is with a loved one and they're, you know, getting ready to die, they're in the last two weeks and we don't really know, Mm -hmm. but we, um, how do we know, how do we keep them comfortable and how do we know that they're not comfortable? Mm -hmm. Like how, what can you tell us today, Mm -hmm. practical tips that we could use in those hours for ourselves if we're in that position sure or for helping a family member what would you tell us sure your your question makes me think about patients who maybe aren't necessarily able to communicate a lot of times towards the end of life people are dozing a lot or they're a little disoriented or maybe they're completely sedated oftentimes we see this in the icu even in, in hospice at the very end and so one of the important things to remember what nurses do is we assess the bodies. We're looking at the physical reactions and what people are putting out. And that includes their breathing, of course. People are pretty familiar with that. But it's also important to remember that the ears are directly going to the brain. There's no spinal cord interfering with the communication to the brain. And so there's the theory that has yet to be disproven that a lot of people believe in healthcare is that your hearing is the last sense to go. And so I actually tested this as an ICU nurse. Oftentimes I'm trying to keep people comfortable without increasing their sedation. There's a lot of reasons why you wanna give people fewer drugs rather than more drugs. And one of the things I ended up doing, especially with COVID patients at the end of their life to help stabilize their heart rate, help bring down their breath, help them appear more comfortable. You know, they're not fidgeting as hard, they're not breathing as hard, they're sweating less. Those things let me know if somebody's comfortable or not, is I'll sing to them. And I grew up singing Christian gospels in the Church of Christ. We don't use instruments, so I'm fortunate enough to have a decent enough voice, I think, to help people. But even if you don't, you can play familiar music, music that these people grew up, like if you know them at all, you probably know what type of music they like. Play the music, not that you think is comfortable, but that they're familiar with. Because oftentimes, 
it is a reflex. When you hear your favorite song, you do go back, you know, you recess back into the moment when you first heard it. And that can cause a visceral reaction. And I see it in my patients all the time. So I think the number one thing is actually song. Yeah, I think the number one thing is song. The second wow. really good technique, people are afraid to touch people who are dying. And it makes sense. You're afraid of causing them more pain. You don't know where they're hurting. Their skin looks different than it's ever looked to you before. It's discolored. Maybe it's really flaky. There's so many reasons that you might be afraid to touch someone. But we forget that healing touch, therapeutic touch. Well, you know this. It's one of the right. oldest medicinal um, therapies out there. And it is true that... You can massage people still when they're dying. Massaging palms is something we do to pregnant, to women in labor to help them not focus on the pain. We'll massage really firmly their palms. I'm not saying to massage the palm as firmly as you would somebody in, like a young lady in labor, but you can massage palms and you can watch people be more calm. Um, I usually go for the, the palm just because I know I'm not hurting them. Usually, you know, the palm is a pretty safe place. But you can also just hold their hand. You can play with the air conditioning. You can turn on a fan. Like all of the things that help you feel more comfortable also help a person who's dying feel more comfortable. And we do forget that a lot of the times. So I think the two most important strategies that anybody could take away is really controlling the sound environment and the tactile or the touch environment. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the. Um... So could we read to them? Yeah, absolutely. Especially, good... especially somebody who loves to read, you know, like pick books that they've read before is what I would recommend to you because we have neural pathways in our brain that when you are expecting something, if you're watching Harry Potter, you've seen it before, your brain already knows, okay, the next scene makes me laugh and you're triggered to laugh before the impetus. So you're walking down neural pathways that already exist in their brain, helping them remember how to feel good. So, so much of this is about internal perception and how that can affect the external. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, um, yeah, like for massage, mm -hmm. any other place besides the hands that you would suggest? This is where maybe I would... Um, resort to your expertise okay. because I, I, I am not a massage therapist. I go for the hands because I learned that in nursing school <laughs> right. um, from an alternative midwife, actually. She was not a nurse trained midwife. She was a doula turned midwife and a, I'm not really sure the certification that she had, but she's the one who originally taught me uh, to massage the palms. And so that's something I'm safe with, but I also do light touches of shoulders, things that are obviously not, and this seems like I shouldn't have to say it, but are obviously as far away from a sexual touch as you could be because sure. a lot of the things you see with older women in the hospital is when they're confused, they might misinterpret someone's touch. Mm -hmm. And so you, obviously if somebody is dying and they're in that place where they can no longer communicate to you, you they can't tell you don't touch me like that. So I do try to be very cognizant sure. that I'm like, would I touch my grandma this way, you know, like right. how would I express love and touch if I was hugging my very alive grandma? And I try to take that same feeling to the person who is dying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, my experience with that, like my, mm -hmm. uh, I did rub my, the back of my mother-in-law mm -hmm. who was passing away and she really liked that. And she yeah. would come find me because oh. I was actually um, in bed with my, I just had surgery on my knee Mm -hmm. So she would come and lay in bed, and I would rub her back. So nice. And it was just so very, What very type of light. pressure did you use? Very light pressure. Yeah, very light. And if I had lotion, I would use it because the skin mm -hmm. is so thin. Mm -hmm. It depends on what they're dying from, but um, that really helped her. I remember her coming to find me. And another thing that I do for massage is that I only do hands, mm -hmm. feet, or back. Okay. And if because sometimes with you, the arm... You could like mess with their with their IV if you're oh, not careful, yes. and sometimes they've had both arms. You know, yes, um, they're bruised from right. all the care. It's, yes, that I'm so glad you validated the hands. Yeah, but also the feet is that sounds like a really good idea. I'm gonna keep that in mind. 
it's very yeah. safe the feet it sounds safe you know, yes you know the because it's again like you don't want to be um going past any boundaries mm -hmm. especially if you don't know the person mm -hmm. but even like sometimes you, you know like i am afraid of hurting i don't know uh if i'm going to hurt them so I'm yeah not, and the feet are really far away and yes. they're still very comforting if i know the person really well like with my mother-in-law, I, I did also massage her head mm -hmm. and her face and her ears. But mm -hmm. she was right there looking at me, talking to me. You had that feedback. Yes, we had the feedback. She, I had, she said, oh, that's too hard. Oh, please yes. do that some more. But if she wasn't communicative, then um, I would have backed off and done just her back. Mm -hmm. And I went in a real slow, mm -hmm. um, circular, uh, clockwise motion. Yes. So that's what I did. And I think it's especially for the uncommunicative people who are going through this it's just so important touch is such a way you can tell them that you're there yeah. you know yes. like people can feel that you're there even children when they're sleeping like I've noticed this with my new niece she loves being held she'll sleep more comfortable she's asleep she doesn't maybe know she's being held but she sleeps more comfortably being held and that doesn't change when you're older people sleep better sometimes when they're in the same bed as someone else and it doesn't change when you're dying like just the simple act of being touched and mm -hmm viscerally knowing that you're not alone is so important. That's interesting. So if somebody isn't uh, conscious mm -hmm. and their family isn't around, mm. do you do you try to touch them more? or? Just, yes. Yeah. I always will hold hands with my patients when I'm... A, I treat everyone like they know what's going on because I don't know that they don't, right? Especially, it, yes, especially if hearing is the last sound to go then I assume they can on some level hear everything I'm saying. And so when I walk into the room, I'm still telling them, hey, I'm going to give you this shot for this reason, or I'm going to give you this medicine, or your temperature is up, I'm going to give you Tylenol. And I hold their hands when I talk to them so they can direct their attention to the fact that I'm there. Um, you're, yes. you're like the perfect nurse to have when you're dying. I Thank mean, you. I try. Really cool. I care a lot about my patients who are dying, especially my patients who are dying alone. I think that's awful. And just in case people don't know, hospice has a program. If anyone you know is dying alone or if you're a nurse listening, you can call hospice and our volunteers will come and sit with them in their final hours. I did not know that. Yeah. Isn't that important? Can we have that link? Yes, yeah. So someone that, that there's a link. We can call. Yeah, it's called wow. vigil watching. You can also sign up to be a hospice volunteer for a vigil watcher, where you can go sit with people who might be at the end of their journey and they're they're alone for whatever reason. I've learned so much today. Yay! So another mm -hmm. another thought I had is um, when you're coaching families, mm -hmm. will you go into the hospital with them? Absolutely, if they want me to. Show them how to and how not to. Yeah. But you also, we've had this conversation, and we haven't mm -hmm. brought this up in our podcast mm -hmm. yet, but you don't want people to die in ICU. You're suggesting a different, that's a whole other. Uh, that's know. a whole other topic we should talk about <laughs> on right. another day. But yeah. yes, I, I think it's important, actually, to bring a coach or a medical expert or somebody who is not your family, who doesn't have emotional stake, but is also not a part of the medical team with you to understand the care that's happening and to advocate for the patient in the bed for their immediate comfort in balance with their treatment needs. So I definitely think whether it's myself, I know actually there are nurse consultants out there who do this type of work, but you can have somebody go with you that is within your rights and even in times of COVID where they'll really press you not to, not to bring someone else in the room, you have the right to have that intermediate intermediary between yourself and the medical team and they create a buffer for you to really understand what's going on and take your time to make decisions and to really advocate for the patient. So I definitely believe you should have a coach or a medical advocate in with you in these moments. Now you had just mentioned because I, I can see now that this is really needed. Mm -hmm. And what I remember a story that you were telling me was just one story is um, you know, possibly typical, where mm -hmm. someone is dying, mm -hmm. they're not going to make it much longer, mm -hmm. and, the, and the medical team says, hey, we should have this really intensive surgery. Mm -hmm. It might give them another hour or week. Or, or they, it might not at all, and it's, <laughs> they'll just say, okay, an example is you have a patient who had a stroke who we have no idea 
if they're ever going to wake up. They haven't shown any signs of it. They've been off sedation. So that means we're not giving them any drugs that should keep them asleep. And they're still not waking up. And then they'll find some other health problem. Usually where there's one serious health problem, there's a million little ones. And they'll suggest we could go to surgery to fix this right now. Surgery is traumatic. Surgery is physically cutting into the body. It's giving you a lot of psychedelic. Ketamine is a drug we often use in surgery. It's also a drug recreational users OD on all the time. It is a psychedelic. It causes tripping. Anybody who's ever had any kind of experience, even just drinking alcohol, knows that you cannot control how a trip is. You don't know what psych what psychological space you're putting yourself in. There's also studies about, um, I don't know if you've heard of the book, The Body Keeps the Score, where it is, oh, it's so powerful, but it is about how your body remembers visceral trauma and can, yes, it can, <laughs> yes, it does. It's you should right read this alley. book. Okay. But there's also stories about patients like having PTSD from surgery. Oh. Yes. And it's like, oh, why my. are we putting people who may be at the end of their rope through more trauma unnecessarily? Right. So it's, would you say that they should go home or where? Yes. Okay. Where You're would saying, you hey. want, where would you be most comfortable? In a sterile room with people coming in every four hours, poking you for more blood with your fingers bruising. You're, there's so many terrible things that I could talk about why the ICU is the worst place to die. Or would you like to be at home listening to your music in the lighting you're familiar with, in a space you're familiar with? I don't know about you, but I sleep better when I'm at home than if I'm in a hotel room. So do patients, you know? We, all of these things that are common sense to our lives don't change when you're dying. Right. Good point. Yeah. Okay. So the, the coaching part, I can see that it would really, um, it would really help all levels. And how about after the person mm -hmm. passes? What is your job then? I really love to work with families after somebody passes. And we spoke about this a little bit earlier, but our culture doesn't really pay too much attention to people who are suffering through grief, to people who are coping with the loss. You get maybe two weeks off work at most to... Maybe. Maybe, if you're maybe. lucky. Maybe. <laughs> if you have a great job and a great boss, yeah. maybe you get two weeks off to mourn. But there's so much more than mourning. We need to celebrate. We need to reminisce. We need to share their stories with other people, connect with other people who knew them. There are ways to experience and to relive the relationship you had with that person and to continue it forward so that you're not cutting off one of your legs and trying to stand with full balance. You know, I think when we lose people, it can often feel like we're a tripod with two legs. Mm -hmm. And so it's about realizing oh. we still have that third leg and how to use it again, how to use our ghost limb, if you will. Awesome. Yay. I'm so glad we got to talk about it. I know. Hey, well, thanks for being with me. I know that um, we didn't have much time today, but uh, we got a lot talked about, I think, mm -hmm. and to just get the conversation started. And um, we're going to talk next time about the nightmares of the ICU mm. and how you would suggest at all possible trying to die at home. And then... What are, what are about the discussions you were saying? What else is that, that next blog post you're writing about it, what I'm really excited to read? Yes, thank you. Well, I love being here and talking to you too, so thank you. But yeah, I really want to talk to people about my experience with end-of-life discussions in the ICU and how it has really solidified within me this passion to help people shift the way that they understand death and the process of dying and why it is so important that it happens outside of the hospital for spiritual growth, for emotional growth, and for true catharsis to actually happen. Wow. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, and um, we're going to have your contact information, so your mm -hmm. phone number, your email, and then your website and how to work with you, right? Yes. All those links for us? Okay. Yeah. And we will send people your way. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ruth. See you next time. Thank you for listening to Your Body Advocate with Ruth Cummings. We're so glad you've joined us today and truly believe you can live a pain-free, passion-filled life. To connect with Ruth, work with Ruth, or to grab your free ebook, go to ruthcummings.com. We'd love to hear from you. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe so you don't miss our next episode. Until next time, friends, be open.
Include the unincluded, think outside the box, and spread love and kindness one smile at a time.